Oh, to, if you read your Bible. And if you prayed for the nation. <laughs> um, I think the part I missed most about not having been here was I had to figure out and remind myself by myself that that was the secondary and this was the primary. It was a very complicated that was actually, time. I was a little heartbroken last week. Jenna asked me. Yeah, because I've had to make do by myself, Ben. It was a very hard time. Okay, so part two. Um, we're not going to be looking at a whole lot tonight. We're just looking at uh, Habakkuk's first um, thing that he says and then the, God's first response to him. So we're talking about a total of, like I think it's like 11 verses or something. Um, so before we get going on that, what do you do when you have hard questions? Like, um, like I, I don't mean hard questions as in like how much water goes through the Tule Creek. <laughs> I mean hard questions like, <laughs> you know what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean hard questions like um, uh, uh, spiritual questions or, or questions of your faith. Questions that you don't have answers to and just kind of drives you insane. I ask somebody that knows the Bible really well. Oh, I thought you said I asked Siri. <laughs> and then I was like, what? Dear Siri, <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you ask someone else who... Oh, okay. That you. I thought you were going to say something else. I ask somebody that knows the Bible really well if I have a hard question, because I know that if they know the Bible, they will give me. Not. I, I, I'm not talking about the questions about the Bible. Mm -hmm. But if I know that if they know the Bible, they will give me a, a a good answer. A biblically based answer. Right. Okay, I got you. Okay. That what you meant, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you guys have anything? What do you do when you have a hard question? Me too, There's ben. a few things you can do. You can ignore it. And hope that it goes away? Yeah. It usually does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can Google it. <laughs> and if those fail and you really have to know the thing, you are dead. Okay. <laughs> if only Job had been born in, in this time. Well, why God? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so funny. <laughs> so, did you have anything? Um, we can pray that. Okay. Might not get an answer, but we can still pray about it. Wait a minute, I thought you know all the answers. Hmm? I thought you know all the answers. You thought I knew all the things? Yeah. Yeah, I know the answers. <laughs> so one thing that this study Bible brought up is, and I think it was funny that, that Ben said that, because one, he actually <laughs> said here, it was like the, the two things that people often do when they have hard questions is they either... Um, get bitter about it, you know, and kind of turn their hearts away from God because they can't get the answer. Or um, they just ignore it. <laughs> that's what it said. Literally, that's exactly what it said. <laughs> just ignore it and hope that it goes away. <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so what questions would make you fall away from faith or if you had enter into faith? Everyone here is in faith, so... What question can you imagine would make you fall away from the faith? Like, have you ever thought about, like, oh, if this happened, that would just destroy my my trust in God? Or is there one? I mean, you don't have to think of one. I used to. I would say if you would have asked me that five years ago, I would have gave you an answer. Mm-hmm. For it. What changed? Um, growing in the Lord more. And now it just... Uh, and and uh, the trials that you go through life, it, it, it changes you how to deal with, with the problems in the future. Okay, so is... So is that thing still, like, in the back of your mind somewhere? Or no. you just 
totally I, past it. I don't think I don't at this point I don't think anything will make me fall away from Blake. Hmm. Um, I I mean I don't say that I won't. You know what I mean? Because you never know what life throws at you. Right, right, right. Um, but I I pray to God that I that I won't. Right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you, you never know. You could be so terribly sick that you can actually lose your faith because yeah. you, you know you, you're yeah. just gonna so be so tired of being sick and being in pain that you'll be like, "Is this worth it even living?" Yeah, actually. Or is there even a God that puts me through all this? That actually came up in conversation over the past two weeks. You guys got anything? Well, if I knew the questions that would make me fall away, when did I be falling away? Not necessarily. Like, for instance, when I grew up, I used to always think, God, if this thing, one thing, not, I, I wouldn't say to God, you know, I, let me say that differently. I used to think, man, if, if that ever happened, I just, I don't think I could trust in God if that would happen. You know what I mean? You do, you get can, what I'm can saying? Can you give me an example? Well, I'll try to think of an example besides the example that's going through my head because it was kind of a personal thing. Um, okay, so like in my head when I was a kid, one of the worst things that could happen would be if I got married and either my wife died or one of my kids died. And surely that would prove that there was no God, you know, that whatever, you know, in, in my child's brain. Well, now that I'm an adult, <laughs> see what I mean? I think different. But at the time, that was kind of like, uh, you know, that God would never let that happen to a, a good person. Well, now I've been around the block a couple times, and yeah, actually that does happen to people. So, and, so more uh, of the event and Yes, yes. Um, sometimes it's related to the question, like, for instance, in that case it would be, why, if you're a good God, would you allow someone to, to lose out on, on their one true love? Well, now I, I view the world a little bit differently, and I don't think that there is such a thing as a one true love. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't like to say I'm jaded, but I may be more, less naive about stuff, I guess. I don't know. When I was a kid, you know, everybody tells you that there's this one person out there in the world for you. And so I had this whole different thing in my head about, you know, if the person you married died, I mean, that you lost out on love for the rest of your life. And it's like, I don't really think that anymore. So it's, it's kind of tied to the question, I guess. But I guess event, maybe it would be a better... That didn't sound good, did it? <laughs> the wind's angry. <laughs> um, so did you have anything? It can even be like something that you're not necessarily still tied to, something like from when you were a kid, like what I said. I know Gracie's told me multiple times, she said um, that one of her things was um, if she was wrongfully convicted. <laughs> 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 the greatest fear for her is like, no. <laughs> I think it would be funny. <laughs> be like, <laughs> go, I mean, like testify against her, and then like right before he does the sentence, and he'd be like, I'm just kidding, she didn't. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Okay, so maybe, maybe like, um, something is discovered, and it's undisputable that the Jehovah's Witnesses are right, and Jesus isn't God, you know, like, <laughs> I guess that kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I don't want to like, skip past anything. Um, okay, so 
Habakkuk was a man who definitely definitely had some hard questions um, that he just didn't quite understand. And I picked this book because it's kind of tied in with Job and Philippians, with the theme that we've been kind of following, about really, is God good? And, excuse me, um, why do we suffer? And, and just the, the kind of following that same theme. Excuse me. But one thing that Habakkuk did is he didn't become bitter about his questions, and he didn't ignore his questions. Instead, he did like what Chuck said, where he where he went to God in prayer. Now, as Chuck already mentioned, the thing about praying for answers, oftentimes God might not answer you. You know, um, I I know of many hard things that I've had to go through that God never necessarily gave me the reason why it had to happen. A lot of times God's kind of given me comfort about it, like hey, this is a good thing that came from that, or maybe, you know, showed himself to me in a different way that I'd never experienced him before. But a lot of times God has not given any answer whatsoever, either directly through like prayer or while reading the Bible or through somebody else giving me, you know, some word of knowledge or something. Oftentimes it's just Dang, that sucks. <laughs> so, for the, the, the first question is in Habakkuk, uh, verse, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he says this. The oracle which Habakkuk, the prophet, saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry, I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me uh, see iniquity, and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists. The law is ignored. Uh, I'm sorry. And contention arises, sorry, therefore the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. So that's that, That's his first, his, first, uh, his first question, which can basically be summarized with, why is all this bullcrap happening? Why are all these bad things happening? So, so just a few highlights. Um, one thing I wanted to point out from verse 2, it says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry to you violence that you do not save. It's like he's saying you're not listening and you do nothing about the wicked. Well, why are we having this conversation over and over again? Why are you not listening to what I'm saying? I mean, there's wicked people. You're, you're righteous. There should be some kind of a resolution here, and this is not what I'm seeing. Um, and then right here, Therefore the law is ignored and justice never upheld. Pay attention to this part. For the wicked surround the righteous. Another way of saying that would be there are more wicked than there are righteous. So I mean that's kind of a kind of a big a big um, a big claim. And if it was true, I mean that's what a big statement. yeah a big statement. And, and, and I mean if it is true, I don't I, I wasn't in Jerusalem at this time, but if it was true, that's a, that's pretty bad. Um, so the basic complaint here is wicked people getting away with it. Or another way of saying that would be the wicked people are prospering. Um, so here's just a little thought that I had while I was studying for this. The punishment was after some had um, had already died. The, the, the punishment that, that God was going to bring here in this next part where he's talking about, it's coming after after some of the wicked people had already died. They had gone to their grave without seeing the punishment. Whereas some of these righteous people were going to live through the punishment. So that's kind of an interesting spin there, um, which brings up a very interesting question. Did they get away free? Now, in our minds, I know it'll be ever so hard for some of us to imagine this, but just imagine that there's some wicked person in the community who does something extremely wicked. Just, you know, strain your brain and try to think of someone who would do such a thing. <laughs> um and, and then, you know, you you never see any kind of... Um, justification. Yeah, like, like any kind of vindication, justification, any kind of Asian that we're talking about here. I mean, or I guess I should say shun. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that's kind of, I feel like, in a small way, kind of what Habakkuk is saying. Um, you know, he's not seeing things happening. Um, and it kind of it kind of makes us think things like that. Did did are they going to get away with it free? And some of them go to their grave and believing that you're wrong. And they they go to their grave believing that you are wrong, and you're never proven right. 
Now, Job got to see, you know, vindication, at the, you know, a after it all. Yeah. But a lot of people aren't don't. A lot of people don't. So in our minds, we kind of, well, they got away with it. But think of it a little bit differently. What is a short moment in this life in comparison to eternity? Now, when you start realizing eternal punishment, it helps you to maybe put the brakes on looking for them to get what's coming to them. You know what I mean? Because past it's somebody hurting you, eternity is a really long time to suffer. So I mean, and it's like, well, maybe I'm not that mad at them. You know what I mean? Like, even if they did, like, the worst thing imaginable, eternity is a really freaking long time. And uh, I find that when I, when I realize that, it helps me just kind of put the brakes on it and, well, maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh. I mean, God God can take care of the situation. He can do that. I, I wouldn't wish eternity and, and hell on my worst enemy. You know, it's just... If, you know, if I think about it for me, I mean, it's, ugh, I would hate that for me. <laughs> can I assign, can I opt out, God? Is there an opt out plan? I, 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 I did my time. I'm not into it. Um, but punishment here often keeps us from greater punishment there. That's just kind of a, a way of life. God sometimes will bring punishment by here on earth that will prevent us from the eternal punishment there. And I, and I just think that that's, in a way, a really nice thing that the punishment... From God isn't always punishment in a way. If you guys, you guys get what I'm saying, kind of like almost mercy if you think about it. So God's first answer here is in verses five through eleven. This is the last bit we're going to look at today. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe it if you were told. So that should be the first clue that we know that um, Habakkuk lived to see the Babylonian. The Babylonian Empire conquered Jerusalem, so he was alive in um, latest, I mean, um, um, earliest 605, and at least up, I mean, at, and at latest till 586. And so because he says this, um, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told, that seems to m imply that he's having this, this, this prophecy from God before Assyria started gaining steam, so maybe like around 650. So he lived a while if he got to see Jerusalem fall over like 60 years later. You know what I mean, that's kind of span of time there. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people, who marched throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. Now notice, notice the negative way that God is talking about Chaldeans. Okay, he just said, I'm, bring, I'm raising up these people, but, but look at the negative way he talks about them. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horses come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. Uh, they fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect, collect captives like sand. They mock at kings, and rulers are a laughing matter to them. Uh, they laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their god. Um, so, I mean, we kind of have a mixed bag here. God in one part kind of says, okay, I'm raising, I, I'm raising up these people. You're going to live to see it, and they're going to bring punishment on these wicked people. But then at the same time, he goes through this great lengthy discourse basically saying, and they're wicked too. But then he gives this little brief glimpse of hope in the end, at the end, verse 11, where he says, um, not at the very last line, but the line before the very last line, they will be held guilty. So it's like, okay, well, I guess that's good, but I mean, kind of seems like a little bit of mixed bag. And as we read through um, next week with Habakkuk's next kind of retort or, or, or but wait, God, um, he kind of has a problem with that same issue too. Uh, so just a few things. Habakkuk lived, lived to see the fall of Assyria, but probably not Babylon. Babylon fell in 539 from the Persians. Um, so Assyria fell in 609, I believe. And so it, that's fully possible he lived to see Assyria fall. It is fully possible he lived until 586 when Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, he would have been obviously an old man, but he could have very easily lived to see it. Um, 
So in verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the whole the, uh, earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. So they take what's not theirs. He's describing evil people here. Verse 7, Dreaded and feared. Now, this part right here, I offer an, alter, an alternate translation to just to help you understand what he's saying. He's not saying, he, this is what it says, their justice and authority originate with themselves. That does not mean that they came to power from their own accord and that God is not in control over them. In fact, the whole passage points us in the opposite direction, that God is in control. So then what does it mean that their justice and authority originate with themselves? Well, basically, they do whatever they want and they glorify themselves. It, it's kind of one of those things where how it's worded, you have to just sit there and think about what he's saying for a little bit, but... That's the short story. Um, now, in verse 10, he actually describes their uh, their war tactics. Uh, rulers are a laughing matter to them. Uh, when when the Babylon Empire rose to power, they they I mean this is exactly how it happened. They they blew in very quickly, conquered massive amounts uh, very quickly. I mean I guess it was just a perfect storm because the Syrian Empire was really was really was a better empire. Um, it was a longer lived empire. Um, but Babylon came sweeping through, you know, just conquering stuff. And the idea that they laugh at, at the other kings is more of a way of saying that they're unstoppable in battle. I mean, if they come, you're, you're wiped out. Which kind of raises the question why the last king of Jerusalem didn't surrender. Because Jerusalem kept, I mean, Jeremiah kept prophesying and telling him, it's going to go well if you surrender. Do not do, not do this. You, you need to just surrender now. And in fact, Babylon gave him... Um, Kind of rewards for uh, sticking up for them, uh, but um, you got to wonder what was going through his mind. I think his name was Zechariah. Um, what was going through this king's mind that that he saw Babylon sweep through, and Nebuchadnezzar was a fierce warlord. I mean, that guy was brutal. Like I would not have wanted to run into him in a dark alley. This guy was uh, just brutal, and uh, uh, but he still he still stuck to his guns even with Jeremiah. Telling him, hey, you need to surrender. And even with Nebuchadnezzar's armies at his doorstep, like this guy, I guess, was just not very big on brains. Anyways, he says here, they laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture. That's actually what they did. Um, um, we have a lot of different reliefs from Babylon. And uh, you can see in a lot of the different uh, images that they've made of the different cities that they captured, uh, where they would come and build up, uh, take rubble and dirt and push it up against the city walls and then just march over it. And, uh... So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, in verse 11, then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. So uh, they're destructive, but not lasting. See, right here, Habakkuk is prophesying that the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire is not going to be long lived. Before, yeah, before, at least it appears as though he's prophesying before, Jeremiah ever prophesied the 70 years. In fact, if if my if, if I'm figuring this correctly, we're talking about 20 or 30 years before Jeremiah ever said anything about 70 years of captivity. So I mean that's kind of a kind of a big thing. They will sweep through like the wind and pass on. So yes, they will be destructive, but it won't be long lasting. Um, and then in ver the, then the next line in verse 11, there's a little glimmer of hope. They will be held guilty. God, um, after God uses them, they will be judged. Now, I thought that was kind of, I don't know if, if ironic is the right word, but so God's going to use someone, but then he's going to judge them for being used <laughs> by him. <laughs> like, I just, that just blows my mind. In fact, one part um, says, I, I don't remember exactly how it says it, but it says some, something along the lines of, I told you, I, I told you to go and destroy, but you went further than I told you to go. Um, in other words, I believe it was Babylon that the prophecy is talking about. God did tell Babylon to do that, but they went far. They did more destruction than He actually told them to do. Um, so they were actually held even more accountable. I believe it was maybe it was Edom, but I believe it was Babylon. Anyways, not important. Um, and then right here, I thought this was kind of funny. But um, they were they whose strength is their God. Have you ever seen those guys um, at the gyms? You you know the really big buff ones that like they're super obnoxious about it, like. They're not like The Rock, you know, where they're kind of just chill about it. Like, yeah, I'm cool, and it's cool that you think that I'm cool because I already know that I'm cool. I'm talking about the the guys that are at the gym that they're just like, oh, beefcake, <laughs> beefcake. You know the guys, like really annoying guys. And uh, I, I just get that image. They who strength is their God. 
Um, so he's not saying here that they didn't worship idols. They did worship idols. He's just simply saying that they worshipped themselves for how great they were. Which we definitely see an image of that with Nebuchadnezzar. When he's standing out on his on his balcony looking at, out over the city and saying, Wow, look at all of this greatness. Um, so Babylonian. If you've ever been to Texas, Babylonians were, were basically like Texans. Like, we are the height of civilization and we know it. Like, <laughs> whenever Texans talk about traveling somewhere, they always say, I'm going to go down there because everything's lower than Texas. <laughs> Anyways... Um, so the basic reply here is, I'm, I am doing something, I am in control, I act in my time. He's kind of addressing the same thing from, from, from multiple different angles. And the, the amazing thing about God's response in, in this very short, very short thing. I mean, <coughs> Habakkuk asked a very loaded question. It was a very short question, but it was a very loaded question. And God gives a, a, a pretty short answer considering the heaviness of, the, of this question. And it's not direct. He doesn't give a direct, simple answer. That's the part about Habakkuk that just blows my mind. God goes to all the trouble of giving an answer, but he doesn't give a, a dumbed-down answer, and he doesn't just come out and say it. He talks in, like, riddles and stuff. And the things that he says in this very short passage, it has, like, 17 different applications. I mean, it just it blows your mind if you just go through and read it and then reread it. I mean, the things that he's saying is just like, ah, my brain hurts. I read hurt. chapter 1 over and over. Right? <laughs> what the heck is going on in here? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yes. So, so there's just a lot of stuff going there. But basically, he God was saying, I am doing something, um, and I am in control because as much as Babylon thought that they were in control, it was really God who was raising them up. And then he acts in his time. He says, but they will be held guilty eventually. Not right now, but eventually. And just some important things to remember. Those who were alive to see the rise of the Babylonian Empire did not... Um, lived to see its downfall. Nebuchadnezzar, for instance, was dead before Babylon fell. So, in his death, he saw his his glorious empire. He didn't see its defeat. And the thing about Babylon's fall, when it fell to Persia, it fell so quickly and without incident. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was won without a single fight. They just, Persia just marched in. The gates opened up to them. <laughs> there was a whole bunch of different things going on. But anyways... Um, I think they had. They, I think that they had, they had fought Babylonian forces a couple miles away, but when they actually got to Babylon, the city just opened up to them, if I remember correctly. Um, anyways, uh, any questions about that? No. Okay. Um, we will continue next week with the discourse, um, Habakkuk's second uh, response, where he kind of says, uh, "Hold up, God," and then God's second reply, which, if you thought the first one was loaded. <laughs> His second answer is just as loaded. Um, 